Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video we will be exploring the INFP and their different Enneagram types and archetypes and personas. So this is the INFP that is less in touch with themselves and that has come to express only parts of themselves. This is the INFP that is in tune with some of their needs but not all of their needs. And starting with the INFP1, the INFP1 is in tune with their intuition and with their perceiving. This creates an INFP that is open to change and receptive to change and ready to act on new possibilities and new opportunities. They are reformers, so they are driven to see how things could change in each moment. They are going to be somewhat more like uh, detectives than like philosophers. They are going to be pushing their intuition outside their shell, outside their comfort zone, making them somewhat more anxious and a little more angry and frustrated than the average INFP. They are going to be INFPs that see how things could change and how things could become better. But they're going to be frustrated with blocks and when things are standing in the way and when things aren't moving forward. The INFP1 is a growth type, so they're highly in tune with their inner muse. And this inner muse it typically uh, drives some sense of anxiety or anger in the INFP, creating and telling the INFP they have to constantly work on self-improvement in different ways. So who is the INFP2 then? The INFP2 is a person, a caregiving type, a person that with strong feeling and with strong perceiving develops their more nurturing traits. They are people inclined towards worry and care of others and they often show care through listening. The INFP cares for and helps others less deliberately and much more through intercepting people's needs and in the moment giving and sharing of themselves by showing an open ear. This is also an INFP that strengthens character and builds character in other people. When other people are struggling they are showing other people how to improve their character and how to show resolve and how to stand up to people's issues. So the INFP2 is a person that, with introversion, feeling and perceiving, listens to and studies people's intentions and works to heal and to help other people through listening and through helping people realize who they are. Then who is the INFP3? So who is the INFP3 then? Well, the INFP3 is kind of the person that shares both anxiety and caring. The INFP3 is driven to do something good for the people they love, but not in the traditional way to helping and supporting others, but rather to working hard and gaining an income and doing good at work and showing high performance and performing well in various situations. And in doing so, they hope that other people will like them and that they will, other people will feel cared for. So the INFP3 pulls highly on their feeling and perceiving, just like the two. But they compromise their own introversion and their personal needs and they push themselves out of their shell to stand up and to be exposed and to put themselves in the spotlight often where other people can see them. And they rely on, rather than uh, how they appear, through humor and through various actions to get other people to appreciate them better. What about the four? Well, the Enneagram 4 INFP is a person of high perceiving, but weak feeling, weak intuition, and weak introversion. This is an INFP that, to some extent, first and foremost values control. They are, like the trees, typically stubborn and they are ready to work hard towards something and to push themselves to their limits to achieve a dream or something they value highly. They are hard types in the sense that they care highly about what they do and the outcome of what they do. But, as force, typically you tend to romanticize the past and who you used to be. You tend to be attached to a previous goal you, that you used to have in the past or an old aspiration and you're kind of deliberate in wanting to achieve it and accomplish it. And the INFP4 
will appear more like a kind of extroverted and sensing type and more like a thinking type than an INFP in a sense. In a sense, because they are going to appear hardened, they're going to appear tougher, they're going to be more combative and more individualistic and more fierce and more about standing up for themselves in a way that sometimes requires them to build up, put up strong walls to other people and to maintain a kind of distance towards others. The uh, this is uh, the kind of INFP that, however, always maintains a kind of perceiving or adaptive relationship to life. The INFP4 is always building their individuality in relation to other people, to what they hear other people say and talk about them. But the INFP4 does not necessarily trust their own view of themselves and is more inclined to believe objective and impartial and sometimes harsh truths about themselves. Yeah, I'm this uh, harsh person people make me out to be and I can't change, I'm attached to this. So what about the INFP4? Well, there are lots of INFP4s out there. The INFP4 is, like the three, somewhat stubborn. They're ready to work hard towards a long-term goal and to push themselves. They're very much doers. They're very much people that are always busy with something. The thing is, this INFP is somewhat attached to what it is they're trying to do. They have like this idea in their head, this project. Typically a project that is a bad fit for them. And uh, they're very inclined to work hard on improving this project and to building this project. And they believe this project is them. They have, they are very attached to this. And this can be a project such as uh, a kind of uh, clear-cut goal or a kind of object, clear objective that you have in your head of uh, work or a career you want or something that you have in your head is going to help you in your life. And this goal is usually something that the INFP cared a lot for. It was a goal that they had in their head that was really great for them in the past, but not as much anymore. Perhaps you've learned something that has changed this. Perhaps something has happened that makes this decision a bad one. And the INFP4 is somewhat blocked from their intuition, from their introversion, and from that feeling of what is important and what matters. In order to stay committed to that project and to keep on working towards it. Now if there's one thing the INFP4 has up on the Enneagram 3 type it is that they are highly, highly receptive to new information. They're constantly sucking up new information and listening to and hearing new things, new things, new things and they are not passively listening. They are not out hearing to and adjusting themselves to their audience and to what other people want. But they are using this information constantly to reinforce this version of themselves and to use it to canalize and to channel their goal. Now I think it's interesting here to bring up the INFP5 in comparison because the INFP5s and 4s are often unsure of who, who they are. Am I a 4 or am I a 5? Well the 4s and the 5s are very different. The 5s are attached to ego where the 4s are attached to com uh, kind of finalizing a project or an aspiration. The INFP 5s trust nobody but themselves, listen to nobody but themselves. They have to think about and see in their head that everything shakes up. And they are less about receiving and adjusting to new information and building their identity in accordance to what they hear, what other people say about them, and more inclined to pull away into themselves and into what they themselves think is right and wrong. Beyond this, the INFP5 is a lot more cold, where the INFP4 is quite expressive and dramatic at times. The INFP5 keeps an impartial head and does not care for so much uh, their own uh, individuality. They care for the truth and nothing but the truth. They are typically very critical people, so when the INFP listens to you, they are very, very careful to flaws and problems in what you say. They notice when you contradict yourself. They spot things you do wrong. They're very notice, uh, very likely to notice subtle things that you need to improve on and things that you are not doing correctly. 
Now it's interesting to look at where people find truth and where you find a center because the INFP has the strongest center of probably all Enneagram types. Nothing can shake the INFP 5's sense of what is right and wrong. But the INFP 5 is typically drawing this center out of the past. They're looking at their history, they're looking at what they've been taught in the past and they're going over this past over and over. And they're people that can be very nostalgic and romantic about this past knowledge and past experience. And this past experience blocks out their truth to some extent. And the desire for their past to be factual and objective and for wanting this uh, and for doubting your feeling and your feeling about what's right and wrong is uh, going to somewhat make the sign of peel shut down. Uh, their own sense of judgment and value and conscientiousness and conscience overall. This sign of P5 is less in touch with their conscience and less in touch with their right, sense of right and wrong. The INFP6 draws their knowledge from theory, not from conscience. Just like the 5, there is no conscience involved here in the 6's judgment. The 6 is not about what's right and wrong, but the INFP6 is about what is theoretical, what is in line with theory, with my deduction, with my speculation. And I'm saying introverted intuition here, but I'm primarily referring to the process of introversion and intuition, intuition and introversion. There is no speculation here going on as much as there is theorizing, there is a sense of molding to gather data and abstract information and forming an idea in your head about where you want to go, writing down and noting and getting an idea about how reality is constructed. Yes, INFPs do this all the time, in a healthy way too. The INFPs just don't use introverted intuition to speculate or to form prophecies about the world, at least not consciously. Yes, there is kind of prophetic quality to the INFP 6 because their intuition is less flexible than the healthy INFP's intuition is. This intuition, this theory is much more rigid. This fortress of theories and of ideas is kind of hard to shake because it's so robust and it's more about noting down and making observations or letting observations guide you forward. So um, the INFP6 perceives these ideas and these theories as coming from other people. These ideas typically do originate from other people. They do come from what they've heard other people say and it's simply often a library or an organization of these theories. It is only when the INFP is able to develop their perceiving function that they are able to start modeling and remodeling and reorganizing these theories and using them creatively. The INFP 6 is a person of, in general, an urge to explore, a sense of wanderlust. Now, the INFP experiences wanderlust in a little differently. The INFP6 experiences wanderlust more in their own heads. They have heads that want to explore and to stretch wide across theories and across ideas and across possibilities. They have minds that are highly flexible and adaptive. They are imagining scenarios and then they are working through problems and obstacles in these theories and in these issues. They're envisioning something and then they're going from that angle and what about from that angle and what about from that angle using their intuition and perceiving to bring them forward, to guide them towards their final destination. Now, the INFP7, just like the other types, lacks conscience. And what this means is a sense of sloppiness and a sense of inaccuracies that can start to emerge and that can start sipping out the power of these theories and of these scenarios. These theories and these scenarios may have low relevance to the world around them. They may not bring out or connect to meaningful events, at least for the INFP's point of view. They might be too thinking in their nature. And so the INFP7 has one lesson to work on, and that is integrating their feeling process that is often highly repressed. And gaining access to this sense of what in these theories, what in these adventures, what in these possibilities do you find 
meaningful? What in these aspirations do you find positive? Because how can you translate these ideas to understand your own life and your own ethics and what you find right and wrong? How can you translate this into your own character and to your ability to be brave and to do the right thing in the moment? Finally, at INFP 8 and 9, why was the 6 afraid of the 7? Because the 7, 8, 9, no, jokes aside, the Enneagram 8 INFP is an INFP of high intuition, high feeling, strong conscience, and high perceiving. This is an INFP that uses intuition and feeling and makes decisions based on their intuition and their feeling comfortably. But decisions that often shake them up, that take them out of their comfort zone. This INFP does a lot of the time things that go completely against their character and against their center. They challenge themselves and other people. They stir up conflicts and tensions and they're often the most repressed in their intuition. I mean in their introversion of all the INFPs. These INFP 8s can sometimes resemble ENFPs almost because uh, they have this powerful intuition, this intuition that is much more opportunistic and much more about intercepting what is to come. Still, this intuition is much more emanating from the muse than from within, from the INFP's ego and their sense of self. The INFP 8 perceives themselves as led by this guiding force. They can almost appear religious in this sense because they believe their opportunities and what they see and what they believe. Uh, this goes with their feeling as well, with their values, comes from this outside force. Uh, the INFP8 is often trying to prove themselves to this outside force and they see themselves as making ethical decisions and showing character and doing crazy and brave and reckless things uh, to stand up against others in the hope that the universe will reward them for it, that they will be given an opportunity or a possibility or some connection that is closer to their core goal and what they want. Now, the influence of this muse can make the INFP 8 very, very angry, but this also goes for the INFP 9. The problem with the INFP 9 is that anger is also kind of mitigated by fear. The INFP 9 is an INFP less willing to stand up to what uh, they see is against them, to stand up to what they see as a block or what they believe is standing in the way of happiness for them. This INFP is much more creative and channeled into a creative pursuit. They restrain their anger uh, through their fear and they channel this anger into a creative effort, into developing something. Now, the INFP 9 is typically the most abstract and whimsical of all the INFPs. This is the INFP hippie. This is the INFP that is uh, somewhat thrown out of their comfort zone but also thrown out of their sense of conscience and the INFP 9 experiences almost cognitive dissonance constantly dissonance and confusion as to what to do next and how to live and what to make decisions to make about work and careers and life so the INFP 9 struggles with moving forward in life and the INFP 9 if anything, has to learn to tap into and to use their intuition in a way that brings them greater comfort and that can be used more bravely, in a way that can uh, lead them towards what they want. And this includes like learning to integrate the Enneagram 1 strategy of catalyzing change and opportunity. It can also bridge into developing your sense of conscience and becoming more aware of what is right and wrong. And it can also include finding a center and taking time for yourself and valuing your introverted nature because a lot of INFPs as you might have understood in this video don't know how to do that. Yes, this video is the start of how I'm bringing the Enneagram together with MBTI and how I show the intersections between Enneagram types and MBTI. I have gone to find that when INFPs go into different Enneagram types they pull on different functions and different letters in their stack. They pull on perhaps their intuition, perhaps their feeling, perhaps their introversion, perhaps their perceiving, often at the expense of the other functions. And what I'm learning is 
The Enneagram types show what personas we are attached to. They show our nurture and how we've grown up to be. Perhaps because of a trauma in life. Perhaps because of a difficult family divorce. Perhaps of difficulties with a sibling or a teacher. Or perhaps just because something small and minor that became significant. And the, the Enneagram can drastically change your MTI expression and how you appear to others. And an INFP head type, often much more cold and impersonal, will appear very different from an INFP heart type. Much more hearty, much more passionate, much more ferocious. So that's all for today. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next video.